or not? You won't see their faces, but you will see their name. Yeah. Oh, here they are. Now it's high, right? There you go. Hello everyone, and welcome to this special webinar event with Dr. Andrew Quitmeyer. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that the duration of this webinar is just under an hour, leaving room for a question and answer period. Please remember to mute your microphones during the presentation. If you have any questions for Dr. Quitmeyer, you may go to the pigeonhole platform at www dot pigeonhole dot at and type the code jungle isp with this platform you can see the questions people have asked and vote on them and ask new questions we won't have time for all of them however my colleague lizbeth will read the most voted upon questions back to dr quitmeyer during the q a I would also like to remind you that this presentation will be recorded and available to our wider community afterwards. So my name is Nikki Barrett. I'm the STEM and Sustainability Coordinator at ISP and the mother of two current ISP high school students and one alumni. I'm an avid environmental scientist and have been working for four years to bring sorry, to bring science and sustainability into more into the consciousness of our school. I'm so excited about this initiative from the PTA to bring in guest speakers to further enhance our work together. A very special thank you to our director, Vicki Stiebert, and the members of the PTA who made this webinar possible for our community. Now I'm super excited to introduce Dr. Andrew Quitmeyer. He's a digital adventurer studying intersections between wild animals and computational devices. He blends biological fieldwork and DIY digital crafting. This digital naturalism work has taken him through the wilds of places such as Panama, Madagascar, Philippines, and the Galapagos, where he runs workshops with diverse groups of scientists, artists, designers, and engineers. He currently leads hiking hacks around the world where participants build technology entirely in the wild for interacting with nature. His research also inspired a spin-off television series he hosted for Discovery Networks called Hacking the Wild. Andrew is the winner of several design awards and his transdisciplinary multimedia projects have been featured in the Discovery Channel, Wired, PBS, NPR, Cartoon Network, Make Magazine, Fast Company, Gizmodo, along with other print and digital internet news and educational sources. Please welcome Dr. Quidmeyer. Hello. Hi. So yeah, should I just try to get started then? Can you guys hear me okay? At least on your end. I'm going to take that as a yes. <laughs> okay. So Hello, everybody. Um, I am Andrew Quitmeyer. I'm coming at to you live from oops, uh, Gamboa. I'm going to show you my, my real background just for a second. So we're at our laboratory here in Gamboa. There's nice jungly things behind us, nice yekes, agoutis um, in the yard. And uh, we're at our laboratory that I'll tell you a lot about in just a second. Um, but first, I'll, I'll kind of give you a bit of a background on this project um, and all the research that we do here. And I just wanna say we're going to cover 
a lot of material in the next like 40 minutes, but I'll try to talk kind of slowly and kind of go through these, but don't worry if you miss anything. Um, I also have resources and websites where you can look at any of the different projects and a lot more detail letter, later. So don't panic um, if you miss something. Um, there's gonna be a lot of weird, fun stuff. Um, so first, I wanna talk to you about digital naturalism and the very basic ideas of my research. The two things that I'm most concerned with are basically living creatures and computers. And I'm very interested in these things because they can both do very special things that nothing else in the whole universe can do. First thing they can do is they can take inputs in from the world. They can sense things. Um, they can somehow know when something's been disturbed or smells different or um, there's uh, different kinds of light. So they can take in stimuli from the world. They can also act back into the world. They can not only just sense, but they can act. Um, they can move, they can make light, they can uh, make beeping sounds or make bird calls, whatever. Um, and when you have these animal behaviors or these plants or any kind of natural behaviors, um, these are combinations of stimuli coming from the world that we sense and then actions that we act back out. And digital things can also do this. They can take in stimuli and then act back out. And those are pretty much the only two things in our world that can both behave and interact with things, which is really neat. And what's cool is if you put digital things and you put natural things together, you can start finding really new weird ways where you can start understanding the designs of each other. But our big challenge is a lot of Computers and stuff are really, really new, but a lot of natural things are very, very old. And the natural things are very old and messy, and there's a lot of mysteries to them. And the new things that we're making are very new, and we don't really know how to use them. And so it's all, it's all very, very messy. Um, and we tend to work in labs with the digital things, and, but we never go outside and expose these digital things to uh, the natural world. And so my goal is that needs to change and that maybe we need to bring computers and digital technology further out into the world to start exploring what they can really do beyond just boring human-centered kind of environments. So, hey, I'm Andy. Um, here's some <laughs> random silly pictures of me. Here's me as an agouti. Um, and what I try to do is look at how art and technology can be used for interacting with nature and trying to do this in the wild, in more kind of naturalistic areas, uh, places outside of a traditional laboratory or studio that you might usually use technology or art projects or science projects. My background, um, I did some engineering work. I also did some filmmaking work. And I've always kind of bounced between technological things and uh, scientific things and artistic things. Um, so one of my very earliest projects uh, when I was in grad school was this fun, silly project called Ducks Feed People. And I've always been very interested in animals and getting humans out of kind of very species, human species only oriented kind of uh, thoughts and trying to have them think more about how we can interact with things beyond us. And so this is a very silly one. Um, the concept was basically, you know, you go to a park and there's people feeding ducks at the park. And this is a very power, very specific power structure. You're the human, I have the bread, I'm in control. Well, instead I made a system where we would put up little sensors that could detect where different areas. And if the ducks went to a certain area, there was this big duck head robot up where the people were that would start spitting candy everywhere. And so now it's kind of reversed and you have uh, the ducks are actually feeding the people and it's the people who run around all silly. And as soon as it spews out a bunch of candy everywhere, kids come running. And so, so we tend to be the ones who look goofier and uh, the ducks are just going around uh, minding their own business. <laughs> and so from that, I really wanted to do a lot more different types of animal interaction projects. And I started working with field biologists. This is my buddy, Peter. He looks at ants. And I started joining uh, people down here uh, in Panama 
uh, because there's this great Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute here, where there's scientists coming locally and from all over the world to try to study lots of different things, and especially trying to study these things in their own amazing natural environments and the incredible environment that we have here in Panama to look at so many different types of species and ecosystems together. And so that was my very first time I ever got to experience Gamboa and a strange, wonderful place of these amazing communities of very different types of researchers all working and living together. And it really struck me how crafty a lot of these scientists were. Um, if you wanted to make a maze for your bats uh, to try to navigate in three dimensions, you can't just buy this from a store. You have to build this and think about how you're going to use it. Um, there's a lot of artistry involved. If you're a Karen Workington, for instance, and you need to make a special device to hold a single tadpole egg, um, you, you, she got like a glass blower to blow these things. We made some things out of this kind of putty like plastic um, in order to hold single tadpoles. You can't just buy this at Super 99. Um, you have to actually make it. So there's a ton of this artistry involved. And what I was doing down here uh, initially was I was working on a lot of computer vision systems. And these were systems where we take cameras and a lot of programming and we try to study what the animals are doing. So this is Sally the ant talking to Susie the ant and we want to know how long they hang out and chat with each other and touch antennas um, when they're at the watering hole, for instance. And the goal is we could do this automatically for lots and lots of different ants over long periods of time and really start to understand a lot of the things about the ants. The problem was we mostly just sat in the lab and we typed in this code. And when uh, we used the code and the ants in the laboratory in this flat, white, well-lit area with ants running around in a plastic box, um, worked great. The downside was when we brought it into the jungle, oh, it fa failed terribly. Um, nothing, nothing really ever worked. And this made me kind of, kind of bummed. Um, I was a little sad because um, I felt like I was taking all these field biologists who really love being out in the jungle and I was kind of forcing them into the laboratory. And it, made, it gave me this, this idea that, you know, instead of forcing the field biologists to change where they're studying, maybe we need to change how the laboratories work. And so I started joining my friends and we started exploring this idea of labs in the wild. And so I would do things like uh, join up with community projects where we made some like mobile studios for art and technology. This was a project called the Boat Lab that we did in the Philippines, um, where we joined with a community to make this kind of community science center um, in this little uh, town called Banilad. And uh, we had all kinds of great community support, and we would have little science stations, um, and it functioned as a kind of place that people would go to, do projects, do art projects, but mostly draw attention to the amazing natural resources um, and ecosystems going on in this reef right off shore of this community. Um, we would also start looking at things like wearable studios. Um, so how can you take your laboratory out with you um, when you're going into the jungle instead of uh, having to bring all your stuff into a little laboratory, fix whatever devices you're working on and then rebuild them. So we make backpacks that could turn into tables and soldering stations. And the main question is how do we take all this stuff and then fit it onto our bodies in a way that's organized and deployable and will stand up to the, the harsh environments uh, that we go into. Um, and we also try to think about, this is my, my friend Hannah Perner Wilson, who's a designer, who also works on a lot of these projects with me. And she would make these amazing backpacks and suits that have all of your tools organized. So it turns your whole body into like a Swiss army knife uh, for doing soldering or electronics or art projects or whatever kind of thing you want to make as a person. Um, you can uh, make and do things there. I'm just checking the chat real quick. Uh, okay, that ah, seems like things are going fine. Um, and so uh, uh, we would think about things like, yeah, how do, can you 
uh, adhere different prototyping things to your body? Um, how can you extend your workspaces? Uh, for instance, making standing desks and labs in between trees with tarps in the middle of the forest or jungle. Um, and how can you make these work surfaces go anywhere? Um, maybe your soldering station is built right into your hip, so you can just walk around and fix stuff for being people every day or it can be built into your clothing. Uh, this is a soldering station with a heat proof pad on my knee. Or if you, another thing is a key tool is information. Um, if you are out in the middle of the forest, you might not have access to cell phone signals and all the information to Google, oh wait, how does this type of electronic work or what type of uh, sounds does this kind of bird make or something like that. All this information you're suddenly cut off from. So we would do things like make temporary tattoos where we could have this information directly on our body. I even got a real tattoo of a ruler on my finger um, just to incorporate uh, some, some uh, information directly onto me or having circuitry uh, built onto your body. And so these things we ended up calling hiking hacks. And the very first one we did in Panama and we tried to actually walk all the way across Panama. We didn't really make it, it got very hard. Um, but the key elements are we hike out to some kind of wilderness with usually a field biologist and their field site. We carry all the tools that we're gonna use the entire time. And then we live and we design and we reflect on the projects and the types of creatures we experience and whatever science projects that we're doing out there while we're also documenting. We've done these all around the world and made lots of different kinds of projects. For instance, this is Hannah again, um, and she made a set of headphones actually built out of leaves and some small conductive thread um, hooked up to a sensor that would make sounds that would change based on the light coming through the canopy of the forest as she walked around. So these are headphones built out of leaves that actually play the music of the forest to you. It's a lovely project. Um, there's another project about trying to make sensors that could go all over a tree and then how to share this information so you could feel it. So we would actually make a little electrode sensor on your tongue because your tongue has lots of little nerve endings packed together. And so you can put lots of little electrodes all over there and you can start feeling like, oh, there's ants moving around near the top of the tree because the back of my tongue is tingling or, oh, they're going in the branches because the side of my tongue is tingling or however you want to uh, create that. And so we started doing these hiking hacks all over the place. And um, this also, oh, is there something? Oh, yeah, there's just some other noise. Um, and so this also inspired a very silly TV show. Uh, it's called Hacking the Wild. Um, in Central America, it was called Sin Cubertura. Um, and it was actually in Panama, to the best of my knowledge. And it is not really a great show. I was kind of tricked into it. Uh, they told me that it was going to be a show where I helped out scientists with, by building different technology. But instead, uh, when we were actually filming, they decided it was a survival show. And they wanted me to say things like, I'm going to use technology to defeat nature and survive, uh, which is very much the opposite of anything I want to do. I don't want to defeat nature. Um, I want to help us interact and understand with nature a lot better. Um, so it was pretty silly, and so I stopped doing that, and I became a research professor um, in Singapore, and I would take a lot of my uh, students out on fun voyages. This is to some islands in Indonesia. We would do a sailing hack, um, and we also did a lot of projects with animals, um, some digital animal enrichment. This is a red panda. We were making a fun food puzzle box that it would play with. Um, this is a sun bear that we were making devices for the sun bear because they, they have really amazing brains, but they're unfortunately confined in these places. And um, if they don't have things to do and things to keep their brains occupied, they start actually suffering physically as well. And so we were making fun puzzles with, this is a series of tubes that would pump honey into different chambers that the, the sun bear could stick its tongue into and play around with and have a good time. And we would make all of these manuals for the different types of animals and the devices that we make, and we would release them free. So everything that we do here is all free and open source so that everything that we make, all the projects we make, um, we want them to just be shared with everybody. Um, and the reason for that is because everything that we've made 
is built off of all the amazing projects that have come before us. Um, so we're trying to pay back to all this amazing, really cool projects um, that everyone keeps building on. And that's what humans do. We all just build on the different ideas and innovations that come before us in order to try to understand even more about this big, amazing world that we're in. Um, so I was doing lots of fun projects with that. And we even started doing our own academic conference. Um, so we found this island called Koh Lon in Thailand, and we rented out a part of it. And we held our first digital naturalism conference where we would have, um, we shortened this, we call it Dynacon. And we basically had 100 people come from all over the world, living and working together. We had applicants from every continent on Earth except for Antarctica. Uh, there was no penguins applying. Um, we would live and work together in this kind of semi-remote location for four to six weeks. In essence, it was kind of like a really big hiking hack. Um, instead of just being like 10 days or, you know, a week or so hiking out to this place, we were going to be there for basically two months, um, interacting with nature, building different tools. And it was so great that we even held a second one here in August, um, uh, all of August, August 1st through 31st. Um, at our house that we have here. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, this is a very quick video. You can see it online, but it'll show you projects of all the different uh, kinds of things that we made there. And so the way that this conference worked is we had just three very simple rules. Um, the first rule is that anyone who came to the conference um, had to make something. This could be absolutely anything. It could be a finger painting, it could be a scientific article, it could be a device that detects hummingbird heartbeats or something like that. No matter what it is, you just have to make something while you're here with us. The second rule is that you need to document whatever you make and then share it back openly so that other people can also make this. Again, more of this idea of uh, building off of other people's projects and then sharing this research that other people can build and remix the amazing cool things that you've done. And the final rule is just that you need to get your project reviewed by two of these other interesting people that are here. And so at, by the end of the conference, what's great is we have this whole books that we put together um, that are really amazing different projects from art, science, different kinds of technology, and they've all been looked at by a lot of experts from a lot of different fields. And they've all um, got these ideas put together and we try to make them as clear and accessible as possible. And we can share them all out. So to give you an idea of just some of the interesting projects, uh, this was this, my really great friend, Michael Candy, who put together this amazing tree climbing robot that had a little camera in it. The idea was he could have a camera, that a little robot that could climb up trees and actually place like camera traps. Um, and so you can actually see the point of view from the thing. Usually in the canopy, it's very hard in like a rainforest to get cameras way high up inside of a tree. And he just put this thing together. It actually uses kind of basically suction to stick itself to the tree and then slowly crawls up. Um, there's an artist named Madeline Schwartzman who made a really amazing project um, called Face Nature. Um, if you want a really good Instagram to follow, hers is pretty amazing. There's all these cool, weird projects with plants all over her face. And this was uh, an example of one of these. And they would also move around and change throughout the day. Um, there's an artist named David Bowen uh, who had made these drones that are actually driven by a plant. So there's sensors that go into the plant and changing, I think this is basically just uh, changes in salinity on the plant, how, how salty uh, uh, the plant was. Um, it would fly around in different ways. So plant controlled robot drone was pretty cool. Um, there was uh, like designers and artists making their own kinds of unique uh, cryptozoological species. So, you know, um, uh, instead of like a Sasquatch, there was a, a magical butterfly. Um, there was a designer, this is my friend Hannah again, who did this really fun, weird project where she was upcycling plarn, or she was upcycling plastic um, and making it into yarn in this thing that they call plarn, um, where, and she actually made these swimsuits and she had this kind of fantastical project about uh, being a tailor 
for the fish in the ocean. And she would swim under the ocean and she would crochet underwater in this whole suit that she made out of plastic itself. And so the project was about, you know, a commentary on this wasteful stuff that we do, but she was exploring it in a very fun, kind of fantastical way with this, uh, you know, kind of silliness of, you know, making little suits for the fish that she would see while she was swimming around. Um, this is an example of one of David Bowen's arts uh, that were drawn by these plants, uh, plant-controlled drones. Um, there was comics artists who would reflect and draw different comics on what all the different scientists and engineers and artists were doing during the different days. Uh, there was uh, Mika Satomi and Ingo Radoff made this great project where you could literally transmit videos and other information by hugging trees. They would actually make like kind of an internet where you actually are sending information pulsating through the kind of electro uh, properties of trees themselves. So you could send it from one tree to another or to a different part of a tree and you could hug it and then somebody else could hug it too and they could see this video or message that you wanted to share with them. Um, so there they are hugging and sending this video through a tree. Um, people were doing generative poetry projects. Um, Kitty Quitmire, who also lives here at uh, Dynacon, or at Dynalab, our laboratory here in Panama, um, she does this amazing art based on different ocean microbes and also out of upcycled plastic yarn. These are the, the little microbes that are in the ocean that if you've ever been in the ocean when it was glowing, uh, when the waves go, those are little dinoflagellates. And so they, they glow and they twinkle and she made yarn versions of these. Uh, there's a researcher here from the Smithsonian named Jay Falk and he studies hummingbirds. And we were actually uh, this most recent Dynacon developing open source hummingbird feeders that could actually have sensors in them. So detect which hummingbirds come to which feeders and uh, learn about their different societies, things like that. Um, and uh, an example of the kind of serendipity of these big conferences that we, that we put on is while Jay was doing this research, one thing he really wanted to learn about was uh, his heartbeats of his hummingbirds. Uh, nobody had really studied uh, the actual heart rate of these specific hummingbirds. And luckily there was a guy who made an open source hummingbird, or he made an open source uh, heartbeat detector that's usually used for humans. And he was at Dynacon, so they worked together and he modified these electronics to actually uh, be able to detect the heartbeats of hummingbirds instead. And so they were able to just engineer this up in a, basically a day or two and actually be able to pull heartbeats from the hummingbirds. Um, another example of one of my favorite projects, I'm very, uh, very fond of nyekes or agoutis, um, and they're wonderful and they're all over Gamboa where we're at. And uh, there was a participant named Jason, Jason Bond, um, who originally he wanted to, he was studying plants and how the plants grew around but he fell in love so much with the agoutis walking around all throughout uh, the Gamboa here in the rainforest that he started studying them very meticulously, uh, very engineeringly and very scientifically and studying their gait. And so he actually started, uh, he ended up making a whole video game um, called Agouti Agouti. And you actually, you can play it online for free. I think if you look it up, um, but you actually get to play as this agouti in this kind of fantastical world. You can even make their butt hair stick up like the agoutis do, and you collect nuts and you can go plant them around. And so all of these movements came from a very intricate study of his, of what he was doing. And this is great. And not only is it just fun, but there's people who need, who study the movements or the behaviors of different creatures. And these are all kind of, this is not just silly and, and not just fun and adorable, but these are also the things that you can do um, when, when you're a scientist and when you're first studying an organism, you just try to study them and you can try to build your own simulations and then see how those match up with the real world of goodies or what happens. Um, so these, all these kinds of artistic projects feed very much into scientific projects. Um, and the engineering kind of stuff basically glues things together and also opens up new ways for us to uh, study and look at different kinds of things in nature. Um, with another participant, Daniel Hogandy, um, we made these 360 camera traps where we could take a uh, whole, instead of a normal single view, we could see every direction whenever an animal came by. So maybe there's one agouti over here that a normal camera trap would see, but instead we could see all the agoutis that are moving around everywhere. 
there was uh, some sound artists um, and they were looking at uh, leaf cutter ants and lots of other different types of ants and actually uh, making music um, and creating different kinds of musical projects with the ants um, by recording the sounds they make while moving around. And all of these projects are compiled each year. Um, we put them together in a very beautiful book um, and they're all on the website. And so we have a book from the first Dynacon and the second Dynacon and they're all entirely free. Um, so they're all free for you to look at, browse through. You can download the PDF for it for free. Um, and if you want, you can even get, you can order a physical copy of the book if you want a physical copy. And we, we charge like seven extra dollars for that or something. But you can have the digital ones entirely free. Um, and so that brings us to our latest, biggest adventure that we've been doing, which is over the past year, um, I ended up uh, quitting my job being a professor in order to kind of run our own kind of new institute um, here, our kind of dream lab, uh, DynaLab, the Digital Naturalism Laboratory. So we got a house here in Gamboa, um, right near the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. And our goal is turning this house into a kind of community makerspace where all these tools can be right out here with us and right with all the scientists and artists that are here in this amazing community here in Panama um, and to be able to have the tools right with you at hand so that if you want to go study this particular ant, um, you can actually bring the tools to them um, and then study the thing there instead of maybe more invasively having to capture the ants and bring them back to a laboratory, maybe in the city or back to uh, Europe or the US or something like that. Um, we can actually learn about the things and the places where these things actually live and evolve and have grown um, in for millions of years. Um, so we have, our laboratory has a uh, like kind of heavy construction shop. We have laser cutters, we have 3D printers. Um, and so we can cut things, we can prototype things with very, very uh, good precision. Um, we have workshops where every week we try to hold an open workshop where people can come around and uh, people can do their own projects or maybe we'll have an artist in residence lead a different type of project. So this is a project about uh, doing, making silicone molds. Um, we have an electronics lab and then we even have an art science gallery where people can uh, share works that people have done uh, from the scientists or um, local art communities or whatever. We just try to have this dedicated space for looking at um, and understanding and kind of gathering as a community. Um, though it's not too active right now. Uh, we have documentation equipment, um, outdoor backyard areas. We have a truck for going into the jungle, as well as rescue supplies and emergency equipment. Um, and some of the things that we try to do with our laboratory are help lead field courses. So unfortunately this got canceled, but we had a really great group coming from the Netherlands uh, called Taxon Expeditions. And their goal is they go to different places around the world and they discover new animals um, wherever they go. Um, usually it's different types of beetles and they, they try to do like kind of citizen science. So you don't have to be a scientist to join them. You can just join them and they'll teach you how to basically discover new species with them. And they even guarantee a new species on every trip that they go on. And I think they've done nine trips and they've had at least 16 new species. So um, they're doing quite good. Um, so unfortunately that had to get postponed. Um, but those are the kinds of things that we do. We also started our residency program where we have artists or scientists um, or technologists come from uh, locally. Um, we have scholarships for local participants. And then as well as internationally, we have People come and stay in our extra um, uh, guest room and do a residency for a week or two weeks or three weeks and basically live here and build projects uh, together. Um, and then most recently, um, there's a giant uh, global pandemic um, that's really restricting what a lot of people can do and putting a lot of people at risk. And so it's a time to be uh, for basically just everyone be as nice as you can. Um, and do whatever you can to be nice to yourself, as well as try to be nice to the communities around you. Um, so what we've been doing during this time is we've been trying to create and donate some extra medical equipment. We've been making some 
uh, face masks and visors uh, that we've been donating to hospitals uh, to quickly um, help protect as many people as possible. We can use our uh, technology that we normally use, like our laser cutter, to rapidly produce this. We can probably produce like 100 items a day. Um, though right now we're kind of running low on supplies and it's hard to find them since all the schools are, are all the stores are closed. Um, but we're doing public service announcements. Uh, so we have our leaf cutter ant friends carrying around little uh, messages uh, <laughs> about Quedate en Casa. And, um, and if you want to share, and it was the whole video if you ever want to share it around to help, uh, help our ants spread their nice message, you go to tinyurl.com slash quedates dash ants. Um, and then also just doing fun projects that we document and share to people. Uh, for instance, we're making an open source uh, uh, chessboard design that's also a terrarium. You can store plants in your house or whatever in your chessboard and then also the chess pieces are different little jungle creatures. We'll release all the design files for these shortly and um, as well as uh, making projects like this is another project by Kitty um, who she made this sloths based off of some of the sloths that go around our backyard here at the laboratory. Um, and she has instructions for how to knit and crochet your very own ones. Um, a lot of the uh, kids in the community are uh, basically stuck at home. And so we were trying to think of fun things to do. And so our neighbor, Andrew Coates, uh, who's an architect here, and me, uh, we did this project where they got all of the, the kids in their own backyards to kind of put up big messages to each other. And then uh, we flew the drones around to visit them and they would, you know, kind of virtually play basketball or, you know, just show dance around or do different kind of things. We had kind of a, a drone party. And then um, we're eventually gonna have a third digital naturalism conference. Probably is not gonna happen anytime too soon. Um, and so we don't really know where it will be. Uh, we're possibly trying to aim for having it in um, uh, hopefully South Africa, um, but uh, we're gonna find out um, um, see how the whole world plays out and see what happens. But um, until then, um, I just wanted to say thanks a lot and thanks for letting me share a bunch of different projects with you. And if you're interested in chatting with me more, feel free, send me an email. If you go to dynalab.net, you'll be able to see all of our contact information. We're on different social media kinds of things, um, at Hiking Hack. Um, yeah, you can just Google us too. There's not too many Dynalabs around. And we're, yeah, very willing to um, uh, answer any questions about anything. So. And then if you are with us in this uh, webinar right now, you can apparently go to pigeonhole.at and you can enter your passcode jungle ISP, right, Nikki? Jungle ISP. So thank you so much. That You're was welcome. fabulous. That was such a fabulous discussion. I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure everyone else did too. Um, All right. So Thank you to everyone who's already answered your asked your questions at pigeonhole and if you haven't you need to do that quick and get in there and vote um, and but I think the opportunity might be over pretty quick all right so <laughs> my friend Lizbeth is ready um, we are now going to have her start asking the questions reading them aloud for Dr. Quitmeyer amazing and the first question we received was how do you get income from all this fun work what is your job <laughs> description uh, um, yeah it comes <laughs> tough um, the nice thing about money is and I'm not too big a fan of money in general um, is that it also doesn't really care uh, where it comes from uh, that much. Um, and so a lot of our work right now, that's why I have this slide in here. Um, I work right now, we're about 90% funded by work that I do making some wedding cakes uh, remotely for people <laughs> in the US. I do some, this computer vision programming uh, to try to uh, have different things project on your wedding cakes. So you could have your your Instagram uh, photos of your engagement uh, project onto your wedding cake for your special day or things like that. Um, 
And then we do different uh, kinds of projects, just trying to get by to fund this thing and try to make as many of our resources open and accessible to people as possible. And we're actually starting to pick up a lot more business from getting contracts, uh, making projects for other people, making educational resources, or going and teaching some of these courses or hosting some of these expeditions uh, like we were doing. And so uh, that was starting to lead to uh, a decent amount of income to help us kind of sustain ourselves and get by. Um, and unfortunately, uh, <laughs> there was a giant global pandemic that happened. Um, I was about to go to Scotland uh, to teach a course um, and, and make some money teaching this course um, that was actually going to take place in kind of the forest in Scotland, which is going to be really cool. Uh, but I actually, I had to make the decision to turn down this job um, basically hours before Panama declared like, you know, the, the planes were going to be shut down. So I would have been, I would have been stuck. Um, but instead, uh, we're here and we're just trying to get by, making some wedding cakes and, uh, uh, just figuring out whatever, whatever we can do to use our resources and the skills that we have and the kinds of things that we like to do in order to help fund, um, more projects for learning about the jungle and, and nature. So you will be hanging out with the agudis for a little more. Exactly, yes. Where the, I second, love the second question is, when you were a kid or a teen, what do you think you would be when you grew up? Hmm. Um, when I was, I think I never had like one specific uh, thing. I'm, I'm sure at some point when I was a kid, I was like, yeah, I'm at my own TV show. And I ended up doing that. And that was a lot weirder and stupider <laughs> than I thought that would be. Um, and, uh, but I think at the core, I was always really into new things. Um, I was into things that were new and then trying to share new things. And so like, I would make a lot of weird little movies and stuff when I was a kid and we would make like little comedy films or documentary movies. Um, and maybe I thought I would be like a filmmaker or something like that. Um, but I think the core of it is I just really, I like finding something um, that I think is interesting, some sort of new idea or creature or a goody or whatever. Um, and I like um, trying to understand this thing and learn something new about it um, and then trying to share that back out with people. So I think I always wanted to be like an inventor um, when I was a kid. Um, but I was always dismayed by whenever I would read about what do you have to do to be an inventor and in the US especially it was always like well the first thing you need to do is file a patent um, and that would require about like thirty to fifty thousand dollars and I'm like well I just want to make stuff I don't want to like you know do all this law work this sounds boring and then I found out you can make things open source and you can just make things and share stuff with everyone and that made me much happier. <laughs> We're so glad to hear that. You get to do what you love pretty much every day. And the third question is, what are the practical applications for these projects? Are they more, are they more educational for educational purposes or also, or also used for research? Um, so I think by my core thing is just that like there's I think a lot of people try to put different kinds of value judgments on new information of any kind. Um, and it's very, very human to look at something and be like, hey, here's this thing, but how is it gonna get me more money or make me live longer or help me help my commute be faster or something like that? How, me, 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 optimizing things for humans. Um, and my goal with any of these projects is really just about information and learning for information's sake. Um, and I think people, uh, I think society tends to push to the side um, a lot of ideas and a lot of the pleasure that just learning about things really brings you. And when you are, uh, when you actually let yourself just like be caught up in something and learning about something for its own sake, uh, it can be a really beautiful and very rewarding thing to yourself, um, both physically and mentally for your mental health. 
Um, but so then maybe like, okay, and so there's Andy's like kind of uh, more abstract lovey-dovey uh, kinds of things. Uh, but then people are like, but seriously, what's the practical things? Um, uh, so the other thing is that um, all of these projects have some kind of, um, a lot of different kind of practical uses. Um, uh, any of the field biologists that you'll talk to here, they, they run into this problem all the time. So they always have to have this kind of like back pocket answer when someone's like, why do you look at hummingbirds? Um, and you know, the real answer is like, cause they're super cool and we don't know anything about them. And they do all this amazing stuff. But then maybe their, their pocket answer that'll be like for humans will be something like, well, um, you know, the hummingbirds can, you know, sustain themselves in flight while they're respiring oxygen at crazy efficient levels and, you know, figuring out how they're able to metabolize this stuff and stay flying could help us build faster, better airplanes or something like that. Or studying how their communities interact with each other uh, can help us um, maybe optimize uh, the flow of data in different kinds of networks. People do that with uh, things like bees and ant research. Um, they'll actually study the ways that all the creatures interact with each other and make uh, protocols for trying to send data more efficiently, um, that kind of way. Um, in my opinion, uh, how to make something, how to bring any of this new information um, into some kind of practical application for humans, uh, in my opinion, that's kind of almost the easier part. So that's what humans are used to doing in general. Um, the harder part is really discovering something truly unknown and weird. Um, and that requires a lot of very open, sometimes very bizarre looking exploration um, in order to dive down deep and really discover new interesting things. Um, and so, that's what a lot of our research is more so aimed at, is this really open early levels of exploration. Um, but then we also try to work with scientists and use our skills uh, for more practical things. Maybe we can, uh, the scanner that we're making to try to scan in uh, uh, stingless bee colonies um, is actually really good for scanning in wedding cakes. And uh, a practical use is having uh, your wedding cake uh, be able to have Instagram photos projected on it in a more efficient way. <laughs> that is pretty practical. So our last question um, is, what do you study in college? And I wanted to chime in and also want to know what kind of uh, the combination of, of knowledge you have. It's not, I guess it's not just what you study, but what tools you need to do what you do. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so a couple different things in this question. Um, when I was in college, I wanted to be a filmmaker and I really enjoyed making films, um, but I didn't really have much money. And uh, I was like, oh man, it doesn't seem like filmmaking is gonna really make me money at any point. So <laughs> I, I asked around, I was just like, hey, like, if you're okay at math and can do, you know, like, uh, you know, different things like this, like, what should I be? And people were like, oh, well, you know, you're at this university, you should be an engineer. I didn't even know what an engineer was. Um, I was at the university. And so I actually, I got a degree in filmmaking and I got a second degree in engineering, um, just so that I could have this kind of like backup. Uh, and I highly recommend that um, uh, to people if you, um, you know, to build yourself a safety net that lets you do weirder things. Because uh, in theory, I could just, I could go get a job being an engineer. Um, I mean, that's part of why I have my wedding cake uh, job right now is because I met some other engineers who were like, oh, hey, you can do some programming and you program some of these wedding cakes for it. I'm like, sure, can do. I'll use that money for a goody research. Um, so in my undergrad, I was a filmmaker and then an engineer. And then for uh, grad school, I ended up going to a program called Digital Media at Georgia Tech. And because I've never heard of these kinds of programs, but there are these programs that basically combined like art and technology together. Um, and so there's a couple of these different programs now. There's ones at like Boulder, Colorado, CU Boulder, 
um, called Atlas. Uh, there's one at MIT called Media Lab, and a whole bunch of these like art and technology programs um, that I had no idea existed. And so my thought was like, hey, I can combine my filmmaking and my engineering kind of stuff there. And then um, I, uh, while I was in grad school there, um, I ended up uh, doing this whole PhD um, when I started using my filmmaking skills doing the computer vision programming uh, combined with the, uh, this lab that I joined studying animals. And I was like, oh, I just want to do stuff with animals all the time. So I started making my whole PhD just about how do we use art and technology to work with animals in natural environments. And so since then, that's been really the main focus of what I do. And then in terms of like, what are the skills that I use? I would say the main skills that I ever use are um, just problem solving in an age with internet. Um, so it's a very specific skill uh, where you can solve most problems with any kind of technology. People act like technology is hard. Technology is easy. Um, Googling how to find the answer to your technology problem can be harder. Um, so sometimes that can be hard. But a nice thing about a lot of technology is you can actually just search online um, and try to find little bits of the information or the bits of code. And then you just need to put these things together. So my main skills that I use on any daily uh, basis are problem solving and then putting stuff together, synthesizing. So if I want this duck robot head to spew out candy and then also light up lights when this duck sensor is going off, um, I would just simply, or not simply, but um, I start hunting around for like, okay, does anybody have a sensor that can see a duck? Okay, I didn't see any duck sensors, but maybe someone has a cat sensor. Okay, I found a cat sensor. I'll modify it for my ducks. And then does somebody have a, a thing for how to build something that will open up something and spew candy out? And then how do I make a duck sound go out like that? And so then it's just a matter of figuring out how do you put these things together and start studying that. And, and then you're good. And then, yeah, that's everything that I I do here. I didn't know anything about wedding cakes uh, also, <laughs> but I started studying that. Well, that's it for the questions. Thank you very much. And back to Nikki. Hi, thank you so much again, Dr. Quitmeyer. It was so fabulous sharing your work with us. We really enjoyed it. And I think you've inspired a new generation of technology oh. lovers. You've certainly inspired me. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. And yeah, it was great chatting with you all. Um, yeah, like I said, hit me up if there's any extra questions or whatever. Thanks a bunch for seeing this. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Come back next week. We have another one next Tuesday. Cool. <laughs>